Hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope that all is well with all of you. Giving honor, giving glory to God, who is the head of my life, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that everybody is having a wonderful day today. It is about 555. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to invite a couple of people and we are going to go ahead and just spend some time in the word of God this evening. And so I really want to let you all know that, you know, I know that a lot of us fight and bicker. A lot of us argue, but I believe um, that, you know, now is not the time for that. We must start preparing our hearts for the Lord's return. Now, I'm not telling you that he's coming back tomorrow. The Bible makes it clear to us that no man knows the day nor the hour. However, I will say that we need to prepare our hearts because he can come. And the Bible says that he will come at a time where we think that he's not coming. The word of God tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the son of man returns. And so when you read the Bible and you look at, you know, what was going on during that day, you'll see that, you know, very similarly, some things today are going on um, that are almost identical to what was happening during that time, but giving honor to God. And I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer here in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to invite a couple of people and we are going to go ahead and get started um, in the word, but turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. And then we're going to go ahead and hop down all the way to verse number 44. And so Matthew chapter 24 is actually a very good chapter. I would encourage everybody that is viewing um, this Bible study this evening to go ahead and study that chapter for yourself. You know, don't take me at my word, you know, go and study the word for yourself. The scripture tells you to study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman needing not be made ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I'm going to go ahead here and get started in about a minute or so. Um, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Um, as you come in this evening, go ahead and hit that share button. Go ahead and share this message out with everybody who uh, you believe needs to hear this word. I believe that this word um, needs to reach those who God has intended for it to reach. And so um, if you feel led in your spirit, go ahead and uh, share this. This is also going to be available on uh, YouTube as well under Plugged In Ministries. If you have not done so already, if you would like, you can go ahead and subscribe. Uh, the same videos that you see here are going to be seen there as well. Um, I just do Plugged In Ministries on YouTube as well, just so that people that don't have a Facebook Live can view the Word of God as well. So um, it's about 5.59. Let's go ahead and let's get started here in about 60 seconds. Um, again, we're going to be coming from Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 36 through 39. Again, that's Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 36 through 39. Um, also, we're going to read uh, verse number 44. And so I want to go ahead and direct your attention there. Um, and then first and foremost, we are going to say a word of prayer. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord, to say thank you. We thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, Lord. We thank you for your love, your kindness towards us. We thank you for your mercies, God. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for preserving us. We pray and ask, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will continue, Lord, to be with us. Lord God, as we spend time in your word this evening, that you will give us revelatory knowledge of what the Bible is saying to us. Lord God, we pray and ask that you will minister to us, Lord God. It's not about anybody else. It's not about getting famous. It's not about clout. It's not about being known of man, but it's about bringing you the glory, about bringing you the honor and the praise. Lord, we pray and ask that you will let this word fall on good ground and may your will be done. Lord God, we pray and ask, Lord God, that you will help those that have an ear let him hear what it is that you are saying. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. So the book of Matthew, chapter 24, the gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. And we are going to start reading at verse number 
36. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 36. If you are, if you are coming in just now, go ahead and hit that share button. Um, this is what the Bible says to us this evening. It says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Verse 37 says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the son of man be. For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the son of man be. Listen good. It says, therefore, verse 44, it says, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh. And so I want to go ahead and put some emphasis on verse number 44. It says, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the son of man cometh. And so when I when and I want to ask you all this question, this is something that I want you to think about this evening. What does the word return mean to you? What does return mean? Return means to come back or to go back to a place or to a person. Watch this. It said to come or go back to a place or to a person. So Jesus is coming back here and he's coming to get a people. He never said that he was coming to get a building. He was coming to get a people. He said a church not having spot or wrinkle. My first question to you this evening would be this. Have you ironed all of the wrinkles out of your life? Have you asked the Lord to take all of the blemishes out of your life? All of us have blemishes. All of us have wrinkles. All of us have faults. But watch this. Just because we have faults, just because we have wrinkles, just because we have spots does not mean that we have to be in a place where we're trying to cover them up. You know, we try to cover them up when we use excuses just like, oh, well, the Lord knows my heart. Yeah, yeah, the Lord knows your heart. Jeremiah 17 says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So, yes, the Lord knows that, that he knows your heart. Absolutely. You know, some people, they use excuses like, oh, well, only God can judge me. OK, well, God can judge you. But watch this. He doesn't want to judge you because when God sends judgment, then destruction is soon to follow. When you look at that, God will also, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm just sharing with you before I get into this, God will also send people into your life that will try to tell you and try to show you and try to guide you along the right way. But some of us have become so hard-headed. Some of us have become so uh, big-headed to where we think that nobody can tell us anything, to where we think that we know everything, to think that, you know, we are above uh, the judgment of God, to think that, you know, judgment will not hit our house. But let me share something with you, especially to the saints, to the people who claim that we're saved, that we're sanctified, to claim that we're filled with God's Holy Spirit. Watch this. The Bible says in, in the book of Peter it says judgment will begin at the house of God. It says that judgment will begin at the house of God. It says, and that the righteous scarcely make it in. Watch this. Everybody that is in the building is not in the body. You have people that are in the body that are out here in society. You have people that are in the body that are in the grocery stores. You know, they're in the malls. They're in, you know, every place that you would go. But watch this. We have become so accustomed to believing and to thinking that, oh, well, everybody in church is saved. Watch this. Every, and I'm not picking on nobody. Everybody in church is not saved. I'm just going to say that again. Everybody in church is not saved. And so Jesus, when he returns, he's returning for not, he's not returning for a building. He's returning for a people. And so when we look at the definition of ready, I want you to ask yourself this question this evening. What does the word ready mean? What does the word ready mean? When we look at ready, um, the definition is to prepare someone or something for an activity or purpose. My question to you would be this. Are you allowing the Lord to prepare you for the soon coming king, which is Jesus Christ? Are you allowing him to take away that bitterness? Are you allowing him to take away that hatred? Are you allowing him to take away all of those things that are not like him? Are you allowing him? Watch this. He's not going to kick the door down and force you to give it to him. The Bible tells you plainly, it says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so we're living in a time now where we must be preparing. We must be preparing. 
Watch this. I'm going to say it again. We must be preparing. I want to ask you a question. One of the things that we can do to prepare is to reconcile with our brothers and sisters. How many times have you tried to give an offering or make a sacrifice and you have not settled the oughts with your brothers and sisters? Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter five. He said it plainly. He said, if you have a, if you go and make a uh, present a sacrifice and you have an ought against your brother, leave your gift at the altar. Go make it right with your brother and then come back and offer your gift. Because I'm going to tell you, when you read that and you study that, you will see that Jesus values human relationship over what's in your bank account. Jesus values you making it right with your brothers and sisters over how much you putting in the plate. And I'm going to say this, Jesus values human relationship. Why? Because we, especially as people of God, we are his representatives in the earth. We are to let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and that they glorify God in heaven. And so I want to touch on this. Obey Jesus's commandments. Some of you may say, well, what are Jesus's commandments? What did he leave on record for us to do? And I'm going to share that with you right now because we are again preparing for a soon coming king. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. This is what the Bible says in verse 36. It says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is likened unto it. It says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. My question to you is this. Are you loving the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your, all your mind? Are you watching what goes into your eye gates? Are you watching the conversations that you're having with people? Are you watching the things that you're saying? Are you watching these things? And I'm preaching to myself. Are you watching these things? Why? Because if we love the Lord God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, there are going to be certain things that we're not going to do. There's going to be certain things that we're not going to say say there's going to be certain places that we're not going to go and so when we look at that watch this I want to ask you this question are you really loving the Lord God with all your heart all your soul and all your mind if you are having thoughts and ill feelings against your brothers and sisters are you really loving the Lord God if you are talking about people behind their back let's let's move on to loving your neighbor as yourself OK, I have another question for you. When was the last time you met somebody's need? The Bible tells you in first John chapter three and verse, uh, I believe it's verse 17. We can turn there real quick. Actually, first uh, John chapter three and verse 17. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read that to you. Um, so first John, that's all the way in the back of the Bible, by the way, first John chapter three, and verse 17. It says, but whoso hath this world's good and see if his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Listen, how can you love God that you have never seen and yet you hate your brother? How can you love God that you've never seen and hate your sister? Come on, you know, and, and, and you look at this and you look at, well, of course, I love my brothers and my sisters. Watch this. Do you love those that don't love you? That's another good question. Do you love those that don't love you? And we have to remember this. Everybody is not going to love you. Everybody is not going to like you. But watch this. As children of God, we still have to show the love of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn to another scripture here. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. So we're talking about loving our neighbor as ourselves. Listen at what this says. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. It says, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all uh, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon his throne of glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. Watch this. It says in verse 33, and he shall set apart the sheep on his right side, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen, let me share something with you. You may not know, but watch this. And I, and, and this ain't, this ain't in the Bible. I'm, I'm just telling you this. 
The Lord knows who really belongs to him. The Lord knows who belongs to him. That part is in the Bible. Now watch this. If he said predestined from the foundation of the earth, that means he already know who's going to make it and who's not. That's the reality of it. He already knows who's going to make it and who's not. Let me go ahead and read uh, uh, verse number 34 again. It says, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So we have to remember that it was prepared for a prepared people from the foundation of the world. Now, I want to ask you this question and I want you to ask yourself this question tonight. Are you prepared? You say, am I prepared? Right. And so let's go ahead and read verse 35. It says, for I was in hunger and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we ye hung the hungry and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we, uh, when saw, when saw we with a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick, or in prison and came unto thee? Watch what Jesus says here. He says in verse forty, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So what does the least of these mean? The least of these means that the people who cannot do for themselves, the people that have real needs, the people that you see out here on the streets, the people that you see sitting under bridges, the people that you see that have had a, a, a um, so the world calls it a, a bad luck. OK, I don't believe in luck personally, but I'm going to share this. The people that um, are not as fortunate as you are. Have you helped them? Have you fed them? Have you done all of these things? Now, I'm going to share something with you. He said, when you've done it to the least of them, you've done it unto him. So I want to ask you this question. If you have rejected these type of people, then what have you done to Christ? What have you done to Christ? And so I want to ask you that question. And you say, well, why do, Why is that so important? Gabe? Why is that so important for us? Because the Bible tells us plainly that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is an example of us showing love to our neighbor. And if you have not shown love to your neighbor, then, hey, repentance is available. You can get in line now. You don't have to stay in the mess that you are in. Watch this, because Jesus is coming soon. And many of us, we have been been so caught up in ourselves. We've been so caught up in lasciviousness. We've been so caught up in trying to be liked. We've been so caught up in trying to be noticed that we forget about the basics. He said, uh, he said to us, uh, uh, um, I believe it's in Luke 9, 23. He said, if any man come unto me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. See, following Jesus is not always going to be pretty. Following Jesus may cost you some friends. Following Jesus may cost you some relationships. Following Jesus may cost people to walk out on you. It may cost people to walk out on you. Watch this. Everybody that is in your life right now. Let's talk about that for a minute before we get to point number two. Everybody that is in your life right now is not sent by God. Everybody in your life right now is not sent by God. I don't care if I don't care how nice they are. I don't care, you know, how good it is. Watch this. You have wheat among you. You also have tares among you. So my question to you is this. My question to you is this. Let's go back to what we were talking about in uh, point number one um, in obeying Jesus's commandments. When it comes to the least of them, when it comes to the people that uh, when it comes to the people that cannot do for themselves, when it comes to the people who are not able to uh, feed themselves, when it comes to the people who are not able to buy food, especially during this time, especially during COVID-19, a good question that you can ask yourself is, what have I done in order to uh, uh, be a blessing to somebody else? What have I done in order to demonstrate the love of Christ in the earth? What have I done in order to, uh, I'm going to give you another example, small business owners, some of them are struggling. What have I done in order to show 
show love to my brothers and sisters who have businesses? What have I done in order to exemplify Christ in the earth? Because watch this. People may not be able to see Jesus Christ. People may not be able to see God, but watch this. They can see you. They can see how you speak to them. They can see how you treat them. They can see what you say to them. And my question to you is when you, the way that you treat them, the things that you say to them, are those things representing Christ? I believe that is a question that we have to ask ourselves. Is what I'm doing now representing Christ? Because if it is not, then my brother or my sister, you are headed down a slippery slope towards destruction. The Bible tells us plainly. It says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end is destruction. I don't care what it looks like. Listen, if God is not on that path, I don't want anything to do with that path. I don't care if my family follow me. I don't care if my brothers and sisters follow me. I just want Jesus. And we have to get to the place where we say, I just want to do what God wants me to do in the earth. Because watch this. Time is winding up. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back next week. I'm not saying he's coming back next month. I'm not going to tell you the day nor the hour because no man knows that. But what I will say is I want to ask you this question. Is what you are doing right now preparing you for a soon coming king? And so I want to go ahead and take you to another scripture. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. Um, and let's see what the Bible says here, because if you're not doing these things, hey, you know, repentance is available. If you don't know Jesus Christ, hey, if he's tugging on your heart, I suggest that you answer that call because it is an invitation for you to get to know him. And for somebody that's watching this, you may be watching this later. Jesus is knocking on your heart. He's knocking on your heart. He's saying, come to me, come unto me. The Bible speaks plainly. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Watch this. Here's the thing about sin. I'm not saying that sin is not pleasurable. The, it tells sin is pleasurable, but for a season, there comes a time where you reach a Y in the road. And let me tell you something about sin. Sin is a hard taskmaster. Sin will keep you in a place longer than you want to stay. It will make you overstay your welcome and it'll cost you more than what you can afford. But let's see what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse one. It says, ho, everyone that thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, uh, it says, uh, oh, sorry, verse 1, it says, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So he's just telling, so uh, Isaiah, this is Isaiah talking. He's telling you to come. He's telling him to come. And this, Jesus is saying the same thing. Come to Jesus. You don't have to stay in your sin. You don't have to stay in your filth. Watch this. Even if you choose to go to a church, you do not have to look a certain way when you walk in. I'm going to share this with you. We have to get out of this. We have to stop return. Well, we have to stop rejecting people. We have to stop turning people away just because they don't look like us, just because they don't look like us does not mean that they are not God's child because I'm going to share something with you. God is sending strange sheep to some of these fellowships. God is sending people that don't look like us. He's sending people that quote unquote don't dress clean. Uh, he's sending all of these people. But watch this. I'm going to ask you another question. When, when you encounter people in life, <laughs> thank you, Holy Spirit. When you encounter people in life, how do you treat them? How, how do you treat them? You don't have, watch this, you don't have to quote a thousand Bible scriptures to somebody that don't know Christ. You, you don't have to do that, but watch this. How are you treating these people? Because I'm, I'm going to share something with you. Just because, again, just because somebody looks the part, just because somebody dressed the part, just because somebody talks the part does not mean that they belong to God. Because watch this, tares and wheat look very similar too. That's in the Bible. That's in the book of Matthew, I believe the 13th chapter, but we're not going to get into that. We'll be here a whole nother hour. But I want to ask you this question. When you encounter people, how are you treated? And we see here in Isaiah chapter 55, there's an invitation that's made. There's an invitation that's made and there's an invitation that's made today. For some of you, Jesus is knocking on your heart. Watch this. He's not knocking on everybody's heart. I don't, I don't care what they tell you. He's not knocking on everybody's heart. But if he is knocking on your heart, then that means that he is he is he wants you to respond. And for many people, he is knocking on your heart because he does not want you to perish. He doesn't want you to perish. The Bible tells us in second Peter, chapter three and verse nine, 
It says that he's not slack concerning his promises, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any man perish, but that all come to repentance. Now, what does repentance mean? Repentance means to turn. Have you turned from your wicked ways? Have you turned from backbiting? Have you turned from fornication? Have you turned from lust? Have you turned from all of this foolishness? Have you turned from false doctrine? Have you turned from false preachers? From false pastors, from fake apostles? Have you turned from false leadership? Have you turned from all of these things that God is trying to pull you away from? Because watch this. Yes, you can get attracted to people. You can get attracted to charisma, but just because there's charisma does not mean that God's anointing rests there. And I'm going to share this with you. Point number two, many will be found wanting, especially when the Lord comes back. Many will be found wanting. I want to take you to Daniel chapter five. What does wanting mean? Wanting means you are lacking in an area where you, you have fallen short in an area. Let me take you to the book of Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter five. And I want to read to you starting at verse 24. Um, so we are in Daniel chapter five and verse 24. Let me read this to you real quick. It says, then was the part of the hand sent from him. And this writing was written, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but hey, just bear with me. It says, and this was written was mene mene tekel a parson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the uh, and given to the uh, Medes and Persians. So what in context, what is, what is happening here? So in context, in context, um, the people who are being described here, um, th there was a party that was going on. There was a party that was going on. And I know some of you have heard this story in the book of Daniel. But in that party, uh, what had happened is that the, the treasures and the cups and, you know, all of the things that the, that the children of Israel had uh, set aside for God, that they had made sacred to God. What had happened is those things had been stolen. Those things had been taken. And in that party, what they what these uh, uh, these pagan nations were doing was that they were taking these things and they were using that for ungodly consumption. Let me share something with you. You cannot mix holy and unholy. You cannot be in a position where you are trying to uh, take the things of God and, and use them in order to fulfill the desires of your flesh. Watch this. This ain't got nothing to do with you. This has nothing to do with you. And many of us need to come out of selfishness. I'm going to go ahead and read this again because I'm going to go ahead and read this again. Let's read verse 27 it says thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting and i want to ask you this question this evening and no i'm not going to scream at you today but i'm going to ask you this question are you found wanting in the balances of heaven many the many your lives have been you know, found wanting, you know, you didn't want the things of God. So you are lacking in those things. Many of us are lacking in our prayer life. We're lacking in our fasting. We're lacking in, you know, our study of the word of God, which is why so many of us have been deceived. So many of us have been deceived into believing things that are not true, into believing doctrines that were sent from the devil. First Timothy chapter four describes it plainly. He said, uh, the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, many would depart from the faith, giving he to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It did not say they would depart from the building. It did not say that they would depart from fellowship. It did not say that they would depart from uh, 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 fellowship groups. What it did say is that they would depart from the faith, meaning they would stop believing. They would turn to another gospel. They would turn to another God. They would start believing in another Jesus that is not described in the Bible. Now watch this. I'm going to share something with you. If you have been taught another gospel that does not line up with this book, then my brother or my sister, you have been deceived. You need to repent. You need to renounce that false doctrine and you need to turn back to what God is saying, because I'm going to share this with you. 
just because it comes out of the mouth of a preacher, just because it comes out of the mouth of somebody you trust, that you love, that you respect, does not mean that God said it. And so again, just because you follow charisma does not mean that the anointing of God rests there. Because watch this, when Jesus comes back, he's not going. you're not going to be able to make excuses as to, oh, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You are going to have to give an account for yourself. You are going to have to give an account as to what it is that you did as to what it is that you said how did you again how did you treat your brothers and sisters you understand what i'm saying is this making sense and so i want to go ahead and go to uh, uh matthew chapter 7 let's go to matthew chapter 7 um and we're going to start reading at verse number 13 matthew chapter 7 and num verse number 13 this is what the bible says to us it says enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, Jesus did not say, watch this, Jesus did not say that it was not impossible, or that it was not, imp that it was impossible. He didn't say it was impossible. He said there would be few that find it. You want to know why? Let me share with you why it would, he said there would be few that find it. Let me share with you why. Let's go to Matthew chapter seven. Let's go up a couple of verses. Let me share this with you. Verse seven, Matthew chapter seven and verse seven. It says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open. Some people have stopped knocking. Some people have stopped seeking. Some people have stopped asking. Some people have turned their hearts away from God and have turned it to other things. Some people have stopped preaching the word of God and started preaching the prosperity gospel. Some people start preaching about money. Some people start worshiping money. Let me share this with you. If money is your God, then when the money burns up, guess what? So are you. But you don't have to stay that way. You don't have to stay in those things that are not of God. You can repent repent now. You can turn from that wickedness now, especially if you know the Holy Spirit has been convicting your heart, especially if you know that what you're doing is wrong, especially if you know that you are operating in the wrong spirit. You do not have to stay in your field. But the question is, are you willing to swallow your pride and come out of all of that foolishness, come out from among them, and be separated, said the Lord. He said, touch no one clean thing and he would receive you. And I want to ask you this question as you um, as you eat your dinner this evening. Are you received by God? Because everybody is not. Everybody is not. And so I want to go ahead and share something else with you. Many will be found wanting. Why is what is another reason, Brother Gabe, that many will be found wanting? Many will be found wanting because of the traditions of man. Let me go ahead and flip over to Matthew chapter 15. And let's go ahead and see what Jesus had to say. Jesus was quoting uh, the prophet Isaiah um, in this scripture. He says here in verse eight, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Listen, the commandments of men and the commandments of God are not the same thing. The commandments of men will lead you to a man. It will lead you to the things of this world. But we know the apostle Paul in the book of Colossians, he told us to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Many people are setting their affections on things of the earth, not because they're bad people, but because of what they're being taught, because of what they're being taught. They're being taught by people that have selfish motives. They're being taught by people that have uh, selfish uh, motives for getting dishonest gain. They have, they're they taught by people that are wolves. They're taught by people that do not care about their soul. See, watch this. If you care about, if you care about somebody's soul, you're going to tell them the truth, even if they don't want to hear it. If you care about somebody's bank account, you're going to tell them that you're going to tell them the truth that they want to hear, which ends up most of the time being a lie or something that comforts the flesh. But watch this. It's a dangerous place for you to be comfort in your sin. Watch this because sin, if you really have the Holy Spirit, sin should be uncomfortable. Sin should grieve you. Sin should make you say, oh no, I don't want to go that way. I don't want to say that thing. I don't want to do that thing. Why? Because you are trying to live your life in a way that pleases God. Because you don't know the day. I don't know the day. We don't know the hour when the Lord will appear, but I'm 
going to tell you he is coming again soon. And when he comes again soon, what will he find? He did, Jesus said it plainly. He said, when the son of man returns, shall he find faith? Many people are lacking in their faith. They put their faith in money. They put their faith in things, but they have not put their faith in God. There's no real intimacy there. There's no real intimacy. There's no conviction. There's no, there's no truth. There's no truth. There's nothing there. Why? It's just emptiness. And watch this. Jesus made it plain. He said, but in vain do they worship me. So when you, when you receive the commandments of men more than over the commandments of God, in vain, you're lifting your hands. In vain, you're singing songs. In vain, you're making hymns in your heart. In vain, you're giving all your money. In vain, you're telling people about Christ. Why? Because you have received the commandments of men over the commandments of God. Your word, he said, you're worshiping him in vain and they're teaching for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is a set of beliefs. So it says in, in, in worship, in vain do they worship me teaching for a set of beliefs, the commandments of men. And watch this. We know that the Bible says that um, in, the, in, in, the, in the scriptures, it tells us that, uh, amen, that the uh, that, that the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. Listen, we don't know more than God. None of us do. I don't care what your what what uh, title you have in front of your name. I don't care what accolades you have. I don't care what school you went to. I don't care what job you have. I don't care. Why? Because that doesn't mean anything in the sight of God. It's all vain. If you don't have him, it's all vain. And so I want to share this with you. False teaching. Let's talk about false teaching for a little bit. Let's turn to second Peter chapter two, um, because we know that just like in today's day, in Jesus's day, there were false teachers. There's false teachers outside of churches. And I'm not picking on church. There's false teachers in churches. There's false teachers wherever you go. Why? Because there are a lot of people that look the part, but they do not belong to God. They do not worship God. They worship themselves. They worship man. They teach doctrines of man. They don't teach uh, uh, the commandments of God. They don't teach you how to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, I'm going to share this with you. Let's go to Second Peter chapter two and let's read at verse one. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Listen, if you are a false teacher, if you're not teaching the truth and you hear this, what does swift destruction mean? It means that destruction is going to hit you so fast, you're not even going to know what happened. You're going to blink and you're going to say, what happened? Watch this. Swift destruction means it's going to happen and you're not even going to recognize it. Many times when people are teaching false doctrines, when they're teaching false narratives, what ends up happening is because they are a lot of times they have a hidden agenda. They're drawing people to themselves rather than pointing people to Christ. And if you're not pointing people to Christ, then shame on you. And so I'm going to go ahead and read verse two. It says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You know, all the people that say, oh, it don't take all that. Ah, but Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, the Pharisees had it down. But what they did was they tried to find little loopholes in the laws of that day in order to uh, uh, excuse themselves from having to obey the truth. And so my thing is this: stop trying to find loopholes. Stop. To, there is no shortcut. We must do what Christ told us to do. We must do what Christ left on record. But watch this. Let me share something else with you. Watch this, because for some people, they may say, oh, well, I, I may not uh, I may not be able to do all that. Watch this. If you love God, he said, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Bible says and plainly in first John chapter five, it says that um, this says for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. What are his commandments again? If you just go back to Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40, you'll see what Jesus left on record there for us. And so I want to talk again about false teaching. Let's go to verse three. It says, and through covetousness, they shall with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Watch this. I'm going to share something else with you. Before I go to verse four, let me read this. Uh, let me read this here. 
And this is just a little summary of what that, because somebody may not know what that means. This says the false teachers will commercialize the gospel, being experts in greed and in getting money from believers to enhance their ministries and affluent lifestyles. Believers must be aware that one of the chief methods of false ministers is to use feigned words, i.e., this is what feigned words means. It says to tell impressive stories that are not true in order to give exaggerated statistics in order to inspire God's people to give money. They glorify themselves and enhance their ministries with these fabricated stories. Thus, the unwary and sincere child of God, that's the person that really wants to learn the truth, that really wants to follow Christ. Watch this. It says the unwary and sincere child of God becomes an object of exploitation because these ministers defile God's truth and people with greed and deceit. They are assigned to doom and destruction. Now, somebody may say, well, what does a God sent preacher preach? A God sent preacher preaches repentance. A God sent preacher preaches salvation. A God sent preacher preaches what this Bible says. But let me get more specific with you. Let's go over to the book of Jeremiah. I want to take you back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Jeremiah because we see that they um, that. Uh, Jeremiah and a lot of the prophets in the Bible dealt with the same things that we deal with today. Um, let me take you to Jeremiah chapter 23. And I want to take you to, oh, that's Jeremiah chapter 50. Turn a little bit too far. Jeremiah chapter 23. And we are going to go over to verse number uh, 16. This is, and, and listen closely, listen closely. I'm going to read 16 through 22. This is what the scripture has to say. It says, thus said the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone uh, that walketh after the imagination of their own heart, no evil shall come upon you. We've got too many of those in our society today. We've got too many of those in our churches today. We've got too many of those in our social groups today. People that want to tell you what you want to hear just so that you'll like them. We don't have time for that. We need God's preachers. We need God's chosen preachers to stand up and preach the word of God, the uncompromised word of God. And so let's go ahead and read verse 18. It says, for who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury, even grievous whirlwind, and it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. Verse 21. It says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and have caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. A God sent preacher is going to preach the word of God and you will be convicted by the Holy Spirit to repent of your sins and to turn from your wicked ways. But a lot of times people are not preaching repentance today. There are a lot, not everybody, but there are a lot that are not preaching repentance today. Repentance is more than, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. No, repentance means I am turning from my wicked ways and I am turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is soon to return. And so I want to go ahead and go back to Second Peter. I believe we left off at verse number four. Second Peter uh, chapter two. And we are going to go ahead and read verses four through nine. We're just going to read it straight through and we're going to move forward. Um, we're going to say this. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness and to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness. Noah didn't go out preaching all this foolishness. Noah preached, it's going to rain. Noah was sent by God to tell the people, to prepare them to get into the ark. The ark. 
The ark was the only thing that was going to save uh, Noah and his family from destruction. If you read and you study the scriptures, you see that out of that whole generation, eight souls made it. Only eight. Because they listen to the direction and to the instructions of God. And so I want to share this with you. Verse five, it says, and, and I'm going to prove that with the Bible. It says it right here. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Didn't the Bible in the original text say as it was in the days of Noah, so it would it be in the days of the son of man? Didn't we read that to begin with tonight? And so I want to ask you this question. Are you in the ark, the ark of safety? Are you in covenant with God? Are you in fellowship with Jesus Christ? If you're not, it's not too late for you to get there. Amen. And so verse six says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Y'all know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, that you can read that in uh, Genesis 19. It says um, in verse seven, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. If you are really a child of God, you got to hate sin, not the sinner. Don't hate people, hate the sin, hate the deeds of the unrighteous, hate the deeds that are going forth that are not lining up with the scriptures, hate the deeds uh, and the things that are happening that God is not pleased with. Don't partake in those things. The Bible speaks plainly to us. It says, have no part with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, rebuke them. Let them know that it's wrong. Cry aloud and spare not. The Bible says in Isaiah 58 and 1, it said, cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. Somebody needs to know that they are in sin. And if you don't say something, then they're going to continue down that path. Verse 9 says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, some people may not like this and they say, oh, well, God knows my heart. You know, I don't have to follow what the Bible says. Okay, well, watch this. You have a rebellious spirit. And the Bible speaks plainly. It says, because they receive not the love of the truth, God sent a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. So the fact that you believe a lie is not because, not just because, you know, you, uh, not be, not just because you've rejected the truth, but God is also hardening people's hearts these days. God has hardened many people's hearts to not hear the truth because they have rejected him so many times. And when you continuously reject God, when you continuously say no to God, when you continuously tell God to get away from you, watch this. Let let me tell you how much God loves you. And I, and I shared this with you last week. God loves you so much. He is willing to honor your request. He loves you so much. If you want God, yes, he will come to you. The Bible says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. So there is something that you must do. It is called a relationship. A relationship is a two-way street. God is not going to uh, force you to have a relationship with him. But are you chasing a relationship with God or are you chasing God's hand? Are you chasing his hand or are you really after his heart? Are you really after him? He said in Jeremiah chapter 29, he said, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And so we have to remember that we have to repent and be ready, repent and be ready. And watch this. The vast majority of people are not going to repent. You can read about all the ungodliness throughout the, the throughout the entire Bible. But let me share something with you. Let's go to um, the book of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah is at the end of the Old Testament. And you'll find in chapter 13, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9. This is what the scripture has to say to us. Uh, verse eight. Let's start there. It says, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, said the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Now, this part ain't in the Bible what I'm about to say. I call that my personal. I call that the two thirds club. Two thirds club means that two thirds of the people are not going to make it. So if you was to sit in the room with three people. Watch this. Only one of you belong to God. Only one of you is going to make it. 
According to this, it says two third, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Verse nine says, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. Jesus talked about it in, uh, in the gospels. He said that they would deliver you up to be persecuted. He said that those that endure to the end will be saved. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and read that again. He says, I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. Does Jesus know your name? I want that's the question I want to ask you. It's the last question. Well, maybe the second to last, but that's the second to last question I'm going to ask you tonight. Does Jesus know your name? Some people may say, well, brother Gabe, I've been in sin. Hey, you can repent right now. If God is tugging on your heart to get you to stop doing that foolishness, to come out of that sin, to come out of that fornication, to stop hanging around them tears, then watch this. Stop hanging around them tears. Come out from among them and be separate. Revelation 18 and 4, he said, come out of her, my people. So if God is calling you, then you need to answer. And your answer, when you do answer, should be, yes, Lord. Do not hesitate. Do not wait. Go, 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 run for your life. Watch this. He said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and iniquity. And so we know that God is a forgiving God. He's a loving God, but he's also a God that will give you time to, to get things right. If you choose to reject him, then he then becomes a God of wrath. He becomes a God of judgment. And I know we don't want to talk about the wrath and the judgment of God because we've been duped into believing this uh, gummy bear fairy tale stuff that, you know, is not in the scriptures. But I'm going to share this with you just because he is a loving God does not mean that he will not correct you. You say, well, how do you know that, Brother Gabe? Let me share that with you in the Bible. Let's go to the book of Hebrews real quick. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to take you to uh, verse number. Let's start at verse number five. Hebrews chapter 12 and starting at verse number five. It says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise thou not the, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are ye, uh, then are ye bastards and not sons. Does anybody know what a bastard is? A bastard is somebody that does not know who their father is. But watch this. You are not an orphan. You know who your father is. The scriptures tell us plainly in the book of Romans that you have received the spirit of adoption by where you cry, Abba, Father. Amen. So verse 10 says, for verily, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So are you allowing God to correct you? Are you allowing God to chasten you? Are you allowing God to direct you on the right path? Many are not, but a few are. Even in the midst of chaos, watch this. The Lord still has a remnant of people that will not bow. He still has a remnant of people that are faithful to him. Are you faithful to God? And if you are, then Jesus gave you a promise. And I'm going to tell you what that promise is right now. Let's go to the book of John chapter 14 and we'll start at verse one. And then I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer um, in just a minute here. And we're going to be out of here. So John chapter 14. Um, and we're going to go to verse number one. This is what the Bible says to us this evening. It says to us this. It says in verse one, <clears throat> excuse me, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Let me share something with you. There's not, you know, 1,000 ways to God. There's not 10 ways to God. There's only one way to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and he is tugging on your heart, you need to answer the call. You need to say answer by saying, yes, Lord. Here am I, Lord. However you want to put it, make yourself available to him. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you from your sins. He wants to cut. He wants you to stop all that foolishness and he wants you to come to him. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn of Christ. How do you learn of Christ? You've got to pick up the Bible. Stop relying on everybody else to teach you stuff. And really allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you with this word. This Bible is sharper than a two-edged sword. So best believe there will be some cleaning. There will be some cutting. But afterward, and, and watch this. What do you call that? You call that pruning. So what happens after you've been pruned? After you've been pruned, watch this. You, you begin to look more and more like Christ. You begin to look more and more like Christ in your behavior, the way that you treat folks. And I'm going to share something with you. Stop treating folks so nasty. Stop treating folks so nasty. You know, and I'm going to say and I'm going to say this. I'm not rebuking anybody, but if we are people of God, then, you know, I don't know if many of you have heard this, but like, you know, you go and talk to somebody that don't, doesn't know Christ and, you know, you hear them say, well, I was in I was in a church or, you know, I, I came around Christians or I came around people that said that they love God, but they were just so mean. Watch this. If you really have the fruit of the spirit, you shouldn't be meaner than a junkyard dog. You shouldn't be mean. You shouldn't be judgmental. You shouldn't be so sacrilegious. You shouldn't be so religious, whatever you want to call it. You shouldn't be so self-righteous. Listen, self-righteousness is a sin. And watch this. Just because and, and how dare you? God brings you out of sin. God brings you out of darkness into the marvelous light. And then you want to turn your nose up at somebody else that's still in sin. Shame on you. But watch this. You don't have to stay that way. You can repent. Jesus died on the cross for your sin. The Bible speak plainly. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He said in verse 17, he said, it's not God's will. Uh, he said in verse 17, and I'm going to get it for you. He said that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. What does might mean? That means you would have an opportunity. But my question is, is, what are you doing with the opportunity, with the gift, with the invitation that Christ has made to you? Have you rejected Christ? Or are you willing to allow Christ to come into your heart, especially if he's been knocking? Jesus said it plainly. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He did not say he was going to kick the door down. He said, and I knock. If any man answer the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And so I want to go ahead and share this last point with you. They, they hung Jesus on the cross. He died for our sins. They put him in a tomb. He rose on the third day. Watch this. You want to know how much Jesus loves you? He died a death that he did not deserve. He paid a price that he did not owe. And he did that all for you and I. He did that for us. And we did, listen, we weren't even living at that time. We weren't even on earth at that time. But when he was dying on that cross, he had you and I in mind. He had the sins of the world. He had the sins of the fathers. He had the sins of the sons. He had the sins of the mothers and daughters. He had the sins of everybody in mind. He came to die for our sins. And I thank God that Jesus died for my sins. And you should thank God, too, because had it not been for Jesus, we would all be going to hell. But because he came, he said, I come that he might have life and have it more abundantly. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this time that you've allowed us to spend in your word. Kind Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you ministered to us. I pray and ask that you were glorified. I pray and ask God that you will help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to prepare our hearts for your return. 
Help us, Lord, if we're holding on to unforgiveness, if we're holding on to hatred, if we're holding on to jealousy, if we're holding on to anything that's not like you, uproot it, Lord God. Pull it out of us, Lord God. We pray and ask that you will create in us a clean heart and renew within us a right spirit. God, I pray and ask in the name of Jesus that you were glorified out of what was said, out of what was taught this evening, Lord God. God, I did my best. I pray and ask, God, that you will help me, Lord God, to continue to be a vessel that can be used by you as a channel for your word to go forth. Lord, I know that you're knocking on somebody's heart. I know that you're tugging. I pray and ask that you will help them to answer the call. Lord God, we know that many are called, but few are chosen. And Lord God, for those who you have chose, we pray and ask that you will help them to realize that they have been chosen. Lord God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. For you said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, we know that belief requires us, Lord God, to alter our behavior, to alter our lifestyle. Lord, you said if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And so, God, we thank you for the newness that we have in in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for the newness that we have in the son. We thank you, Lord God, for Jesus coming because he came to seek and save those who were lost. And Father God, we thank you for these and for all things in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So the book of Numbers, chapter six, verse 22, it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying on this wise, you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Listen, I love you all with the love of Christ. Again, if this word has blessed you, go ahead and share it out with somebody that needs to hear this word. Listen, we are preparing for a soon coming king. I love you all with the love of Christ. And if I don't see some of y'all on this side of heaven, then I pray that when it does come time for us to meet our Lord and Savior, that I see you there. I love you all with the love of Christ. God bless you.